seen a lot of other guys for the role yeah and then somebody that was casting a different movie a movie a horror movie called the entity yeah uh, <laughs> saw a play I did in New York and she said can you fly out to LA and audition for this movie I didn't get that part and she was she was great um, she made a phone call over to Stephen's office and said you know I think you're casting a boy and and so I got in late, and so I think that helped me because they'd already seen a lot of other people, yeah. and it was like a fresh face. Sometimes that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you come in and they're but already you also very were incredibly yeah. talented. No. The they, yes. they didn't show me the script either. They they showed yes. they just had me do like an improv with the with the uh, stuffed animal. They said this is the weirdest thing you've ever seen in your brothers taking it out of the closet and just react. Do you remember You're kidding! That was my that was my audition for Fenton oh, and Finder. Oh, see, I didn't know yeah. that story. We and, did and so they, many of these together, and we don't know all these. And stories. they had me read with like five different guys reading for Elliot, and none of them were Henry. I read of with uh, <laughs> with all these guys, and they were all kind of like kids that were had done a lot of stuff. They were child actors in Hollywood, so I had seen them a lot, and they were all on like Bad News Bears, and you know. But then Henry. Henry, you've seen his audition on YouTube. He just, they, they told him he got the part at the audition. Oh. Because he was crying and, you know. But they already, I think they'd already cast him because they saw him in a movie called Raggedy Man, uh, Steven. And he, you know, he's amazing in that movie too. He's great in E.T., but he's yeah. also great in that. I mean, honestly, he's great in everything. I wish he was here. <laughs> and then Drew, I know this for a fact, she had read for Poltergeist. And for uh, Heather O'Rourke's part. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. And Stephen, same thing. Stephen said, you know, maybe yeah. not this one, but yeah. the next one. He's he's really quite brilliant at seeing the quality that he wants mm -hmm. and putting the right actor in it. Yeah, it's like maybe not for this one, but maybe next one for yeah. the So you must have that. And I want everybody memory. to know Henry is really sorry you couldn't be here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah doing a movie yeah. and it's in Canada and if he left they would have to quarantine him for two weeks mm -hmm. and shut the movie down and the yeah. movie wasn't willing to do that so right I mean as he shouldn't no absolutely but it's not like he just shined no. on you know yeah, yeah. No. I mean it happens so I know a lot of people who were supposed to get another con that we did and they're like English based, and so yeah. they can't get here, or Australia based. We were supposed to do a con in, in yeah. England in June. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Boris 
Johnson uh, canceled, you know, did the uh, travel restrictions yeah. right before that, right before we were supposed to go over there. Yeah, I mean, it's a world of adaptation, isn't it? <laughs> but we're happy to be here. Yeah. Awesome. So, Robert, how did you get involved in acting? What's your acting journey? <laughs> I told, I told Shatner in one of these things, I, you're the reason I'm an actor, which is actually true. Because I, I wrote a script, I was a big Star Trek fan. I wrote a script in the sixth grade, a Star Trek script, mm -hmm. and nobody else wanted to do it. So I had to act in it, I had to act all the parts. <laughs> so that's how I, and then I just did community theater, dinner theater, yeah. and it sort of, it, ste it snowballed. So I ended up doing a, a play off Broadway in New York, and that was pretty much how I got every duel after that was because a lot of people saw the play and Absolutely. you know have me in and read for other things. Yeah. Well you never know who's walking, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and do you were a dancer first, right? Ballet? Uh yeah, I started out professionally as a dancer, yeah. But I you know, if I had to tell you how I got started in acting, it was that I was born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I I just think I was always meant to do this. Um, my mother was a beautiful actress in Kansas City uh, in local theater. And she also directed and produced all the religious plays at our church. So I started out as the baby Jesus. <laughs> cool. And ended up as the Virgin Mary before I left for New York. <laughs> to Another Mary. Mary. Another Mary. There you go. <laughs> about eight years old sitting in the congregation watching my mother do a 30 minute what we would call dramatic reading now monologue and people grown men were crying and sobbing and I went oh I want to do this I want to move people like my mom does so here I am yeah, I, I get off on girl men crying too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tea was great. You're a sick, <laughs> sick girl. <laughs> <old boy. laughs> you know, the tea, it's a wonderful life, all those greats. Yeah. I get on and cry, right? I remember I, I, the first time I saw it in a theater with a regular audience, not a sneak preview yeah, or, thank you. or suits. I was in Vermont, in Barry, Vermont. And I was literally, I was next to this guy with his little kid, you know, and he was like, you know, a regular guy and watching the movie. And I look over and he's, he's sobbing. And his yeah. kid's like five, and the kid's like, you know, just not crying or anything. And then he looks over and he goes, wait, you're the guy from the movie. He goes, what are you doing in Barry, Vermont? <laughs> like he couldn't put two and two together. Because yeah. it was a little theater. Yeah. And, you know, and so I, I kind of stayed away from all the hoopla. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. so we didn't go to the premiere. Um, I think uh, we didn't. I don't have even a know premiere. if it was an official no, premiere. No, we didn't yeah. have an official premiere. But I took a bunch of my acting students over to the Cinerama Dome the day it opened because the only other time I'd seen it was with a bunch of what we call suits from Universal executives, and everybody's afraid to react in any way because if their boss doesn't. Yeah, in the same way, you know, they're SOL. So um, I walked out of that screening going, oh, I think my career's over. This, it's a dud. And then I saw it with the people at mm -hmm. Cinerama Dome, and it was uh, an entirely different experience. It was the, amazing. The screening I went to, like it was, I don't know at what point along the way, but it was uh, New York critics, <laughs> John Simon was there at the, oh. at the one I did. <laughs> and so I remember te being terrified of John Simon because he had a reputation. Yeah, he could uh, make you or break you. And uh, he, was a, he was a film critic and a theater critic for the New Yorker, no, New York Magazine. Yeah. And so I think Pauline Kael was probably there too, but I walked out of the theater and I was like terrified because he's these guys that could break you basically yeah. Yeah. and weren't afraid to. So we thought, but no, I really, really nothing can break this now. <laughs> It's our Wizard of Oz. It's going to go on forever. Absolutely. I mean, I think the the 
commercial from two years ago said that, the Xfinity commercial. My residuals say that. <laughs> that too. But if people are still trying to do it. There you like, go. Yeah. yeah, you know, they did a pretty good job with the actual ET because I don't like the CGI. The no, CGI they was did. Cool, they but did, but right. that seemed like they, you know, seemed natural like the original ET. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm anti CGI. I don't know about everybody else here, but I always was a practical over CGI. Oh, me too. Yeah. They asked me to do Critters Attack uh -huh. a couple of years ago, and I my first question was, are you doing the real critters or are you doing CGI? Because if it was CGI, I would have done it. Absolutely. Can you imagine critters? Yeah. CGI critters? critters. Can you imagine Cujo with no. CGI dogs? No. No. It's called Jumanji. Yeah. So guys, what was the most fun scene to shoot in ET? You go. <laughs> there was a, I mean, there was a lot of fun scenes. Right. A lot of scenes where, you know, when he's, even scenes I'm not in, I had fun watching or being around. Uh, the Halloween scene was really fun. The outside when we're going, taking him trick or treating, and he's dressed up in that outfit. Yeah, that that would be mine. Uh, for sure. But, but my favorite scene for me was the scene in the garage with Henry that we had. It was kind of like a more intimate scene. Uh, where we're going through our dad's things. Mm -hmm. That one, that one mm -hmm. was satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. So that one, your favorite scene as well? Oh uh, yeah, with the scream and him falling over. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. A lot you of moving parts. A lot of improv. And the, you know, the whole thing when the kids don't come home and I'm sitting there with the candle and my little wand, mm -hmm. and Stephen says to me. Um, just tap the candle out. Oh, we're rolling, right? And I, I don't know how many times, and finally I just took it and went, boom! And it just worked, you know? It, just, it was like such a button for the scene, so. Was there a most difficult scene that you had to shoot? For me, difficult just physically and kind of wearing me out, there's a scene where he teases in the stream. Yeah. And there's a bunch of animals in the scene, which it always is trouble because if there's yeah. more than yeah. one, you, well, one time there's like a raccoon and there's like a deer, I think, and there's like a bunch of animals. Again, no CGI, right? Right. <laughs> so then I had to go down in the stream and I, they had like 10 changes of clothes for me. So I, every time I had to go down in the stream yeah. and it was raining and it was up in Crescent City in the Redwoods. Mm -hmm. And that was like the very close to the end of filming. And I was running down a hill, and every time I was just getting exhausted and going into the water and coming out, getting changed. That's why they paid you the big bucks. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's where I earned my lit my. Uh, that's where the scale really. <laughs> <laughs> really earned the scale. Oh, Do you have Mine a was waiting. That was the waiting. hardest part for me doing ET. Well, you got to go to school. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah we, were never, we were never just. I just sat and my I needle pointed a pillow this big to ready to be <laughs> And I don't needle point. Okay. It's uh, really not fair to the adult actors in uh, California God. specifically when when they have kids and they have to juggle a schedule. So they have they're allowed to use the kids for four hours of work time. And it's almost like they got a stopwatch. Yeah. And so that yeah. anytime they're not working, they have to be in school because they also have to have three hours of school on the set. So they always do this. They make the they make D show up five in the morning, call at five in the morning, get in makeup. We don't get in makeup. Then they try to film our scenes, but then something will go wrong. And then they, you know, they film around us and they always try to juggle that schedule. And she's waiting. Uh, yeah, I literally you know? sat in my dressing room for three weeks. One time before I walk on a set to work. And you know, we're like racehorses. You bring us to the set and we go, okay, I'm going to run. I know my line. Run. Yeah. I'm going to run. Go. Yeah. And then they take you and they groom you, right? Uh -huh. And they dress you. Uh -huh. And we go, take me to the gate. Take me to the <laughs> gate. And when they don't take you to the gate, you just want to break the gate down. <laughs> it's, it's hard to keep your energy. Yes. At 
the level where you might be able to go on the set. Yeah. And then they hand you the script changes to relearn, well, <laughs> relearn the dialogue. Well, then one day the AD and I, this is like, I'm like, ooh. And the AD comes and says, D, okay, we're going to do the, the end scene where E.T. is taking off. Okay, hurry up, come on, we're ready to shoot. We've got to get it before lunch. And I'm, I'm walking like, what are we doing? <laughs> Which one are we doing? Right? And we get there, and Stephen says, okay, D, you know, it's, it's after Elliot said goodbye, and you're seeing the, and it, it looks like a rainbow. Okay, roll it, and I'm, Thank God I, I have, you know, a, a way to work that just drops in in the moment. And I just kind of open my heart and, because I love rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> and I envisioned this rainbow and the tears came and, and they went, all right, lunch. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that sound so Strike the incredibly out. Hollywood? <laughs> it sounds so incredibly stressful if you're not ready, but you always are because well, you're a pro. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that comes to the job. Show up ready, right? And uh, I mean, you and Peter both, because Peter was in a similar, not to the extent that you were, but I mean, he would do car tricks. I remember Peter Coyote. Was, Peter Coyote that played the doctor. Um, in the end, and he was in the same situation yeah. for his scenes, and then especially more so because the scenes at the end were very hectic, where they had real a real medical team, all real doctors. There were uh, real ER doctors. Do you know that, you know, that everybody was a real doctor no. in that end scene? I did not. Now, yeah, they, two of them were doctors that were also actors, and they had them go through and do like a, a code blue situation. Uh, the guy that shouts out. Or there, I was a lady that shouts out, he's got DNA, uh, you know, and she was a real like geneticist. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they really attempted to mm -hmm. have the real people and then said, do what you do mm -hmm. to make it real. And this is before ER and all the uh, procedural shows. Yeah. Do we have any audience questions? Yes. 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 Like you said, it's y'all just the bond. Yeah, it's a classic. Stephen actually asked me that yeah. on the set. That they were already talking about it, and I said personally, Stephen, if it's what we think it's going to be, I think you should leave it a classic. So they were going for it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Financially, it would be right. really great if we did another one. You both look great, by the way. Ah, uh, thank you. Thanks. But yeah, I, I am happy. Are you? I, I am. Uh, you know, I'm glad they didn't do it back then because I was already, you know, enough of a head case. I don't think I needed any more uh, swelling <laughs> on my head uh, at that point in my life. I would have kept you in shape. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, it, I mean, the, it's funny because I never, Henry had seen a treatment. I think they had talked with him about the ideas that they had for ET, but I never saw the treatment until it came on the internet a few years ago. And it wasn't a fully fleshed out story idea, but it didn't, it, it, it seemed to me like they'd be reaching to, yeah. to, to get a storyline that didn't really fit in with ET. I have never seen this. Well, it's on. It's online, and it's kind of like evil aliens. And Melissa oh, wrote it. Melissa wrote it. So evil it was, alien. Oh no. Yeah. No. no. Was against the grain of what she was, right? Yeah. Let me tell you, we got it right. Yeah. Aliens are here to help us. We got it right. I wouldn't have done it if it there if it was about evil aliens. I wouldn't. Somebody came, asked me in an interview. A couple of years ago, about a sequel, I said, I don't know, the kids are grown, I'm old, and the dog's dead. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you guys. That sums it up. You, I mean, you guys, you could come back and visit your kids now. 
Well, that's uh, that's I sort of what they achieved with the commercial. Absolutely. I think. That, I think that everything that all the ideas of ET coming back, they did achieve that with the commercial. I, I mean, that was nice to see that he's coming back to visit his friend Elliot, you know, who has his own family, without sort of muddying the waters with with uh, a plot. And, no, you know, it was a grandma. They could have shoehorned this. Yeah. <laughs> Grandma and Uncle. <laughs> I think hey, we just, yeah, we just happened yeah. to drop by that day. Right. Yes. Me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the, the kitchen scene in the beginning of the movie. Uh -huh. How, you know, the douchebag talk and the pointing to the, the butt and all that. How much of that was, like, the script? And how much of that was just, like, teenage boys? Was it all scripted or? There was a lot of improv yeah. in there, but I'll let him address that because yeah. I was just showing my butt and they were doing everything to it. So. Well, they set up this D&D &D game and it was it was specifically in the script. It was supposed to be Dungeons and Dragons that we're playing. And so I remember one of the auditions that we did was in a real Dungeons and Dragons game. And it was with some of the other actors that ended up in the movie and a couple that didn't. Uh, but we, it was at Harrison Ford's house because he lived with Melissa Matheson and wrote the script. So, I mean, I was just excited to be at Harrison Ford's house. <laughs> he comes out of a towel. It's like a guy from, you know, Raiders. It's, it comes out, and he comes out of the shower in a towel, and he's, like, grumpy. <laughs> he, Never like, grumpy. heard this story either. Yeah. yeah, he's like, he was filming, I think he was filming Blade Runner at the time. And so, you know, so he's like, probably, what are these kids doing in my house? Because it was, it was his kids who are our same ages, uh, Ben and Willard. Uh, ben is my age and Willard was Henry's age. So it was it was more Ben wasn't playing, Willard was playing with his friends and uh, the kids that were reading for ET. So we had this D&D &D game. And so that some of that ended up being incorporated into the script for the scene. And then when we were on the set, we were encouraged to sort of improv during the game. Um, but a lot, a lot of the, the lines is just because because uh, Melissa had a really good ear for for teenagers. Yeah. She she was around teenagers. She was almost like another she teenager. She had a good ear for life. Yeah. She really did. She, but she really, you know, was really and she and she would work with us too. She would listen to our ideas, and you could bounce stuff off of her, and you know, she was very approachable, and she would incorporate our ideas into the script. represents our world at different times. And it also represents Stephen at different times in his life. He had had a lot of kids by then. And he felt responsible about what he was putting out to kids. So, um, you know, for the purists, they have that one. I, I, I don't have a huge reaction to it like a lot of people do because I I think like it's the sign of the times and things change, you know. I, I was happy when they took out the guns, not not on an anti-gun stance or anything like that, but just the, it, it kind of, it was kind of jarring that they had the guns in the first place with the shotgun. Like right when we take off, there's a guy cocking a shotgun, like you're gonna shoot us out of the sky or, you know. <laughs> And so I had no problem with that. I did have a problem with the CGI stuff that they added and sort of stuff that they seemed like they were padding a movie that didn't need any padding. Yeah, yeah, uh, like the bathroom scene. Yeah, yeah. And, there, and there was a scene that they didn't include with Harrison Ford in it that you could find on YouTube. There was a scene uh, where Henry goes to the principal's office and, and he's, uh, he has a scene with Harrison Ford plays the principal. Uh, principal Han Solo, or Principal Harold Solo. <laughs> and you see his little name plate. But it was right, that scene would have been put in right right when all the, uh, right after the frog scene and before the scene where you're coming home from school and you find out that Elliot's drunk. 
and there's just no way that it would just break up the momentum right there. Yeah. So that yeah. was why that scene wasn't included, I think. Well, there was a whole B story, too, about E.T. having a crush on Mary that ultimately had to, a lot of it had to come out because it just dissipated the point of view, you know, of Henry and E.T. Um, but there's a couple of shots in there when he's looking through the blinds at me reading to Gertie. And when he comes in and puts the, that's Reese's going pieces in. on your pillow, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. And when he's eyeing you up and down in the, in the costume. Yeah. 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 In the ghost costume, he's like looking at me. <laughs> I have good legs. <laughs> now that was definitely in the script, but yeah, I think a lot of decisions were made in the editing room to do with the music, once they had the music and the yeah. flow. Um, I saw a version of it without music when I was looping, when we were doing the dialogue. And it was a very different movie. I mean, very much more intimate, not quite as like thrilling and rousing. I think probably you could say that about most movies. The, the music it changes it. Well, it changes it. It, it enhances it. it. It gives you cues about emotionally where, where you're want supposed you to, to go. go. Yeah. I watched. Um, there's a movie, and it, it's funny because there, there's some directors that set out to purposely no, not use any music. You know, like in, independent film directors, but a big one is Dog Day Afternoon has no music in it except oh, for the very yeah. beginning, no score, just the very beginning and in the credits and the very end, and then the whole movie has no music. Well, it worked. It works. Yeah. <laughs> Best picture, yeah. yeah. I saw some more. Yeah, man. Three, About three, three months. months. The shooting schedule, just the shooting schedule was 66 days. And you know, that that's not like uh, in a row. Have I ever needed to know up. anything? I just <laughs> well, I found the call sheets. I found the actual call sheets. Of and he, course you did. He brought it in, you know, on budget, under budget and on time. So, but that, that, that doesn't take into account weekends and you know, so it was, it was three months total when you, you know, add in the days off and everything. Mm -hmm. And then the, the post production took another three months. Yeah. Well, that's it. We post. Yeah. Post three months, and then the next summer it was works out. Really next May. It's impressive. Well, obviously it's laser focused. Yeah. yeah. The beautiful yes. young lady in the scarf. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is for Robert. Um, being that you were a child actor and knowing what you know now, would would you elect, Would you let your kids? Uh, of course, I, if they, I would let them do whatever they wanted to do. As far as I wouldn't as push, kids, I wouldn't push them you into it. As kids. Of course, if they wanted to do, if they wanted to do anything, if they wanted to be a musician, if they wanted to, I would try to do what my, I think my parents did, which was encourage our, you know, different likes. Or, you know, my brother was into photography, and my dad, you know, threw everything yeah. he had into getting him lessons. And I know, I know you feel the same way with uh, I, I, you know, I think we're just a lot of times born into our passions. Uh, there's a lot of you know how successful my daughter is, and she has a best selling book out, and her second one's coming out now, and she's directed me in a lot of shorts that she's produced and directed. I have a, a sonogram of her going like this. <laughs> I mean, she was dancing, acting, singing. Every night of our life, we watched a play or a dance or some kind of, pre that's just who she was. Yeah. And to try and direct her away from who she was, I think is why we have maybe have a lot of really angry people in the Mm -hmm. So people need to be who they are in their heart. So do you, I know about her first book, but what's the second book that's about to come out? It, oh, God, I hope I get this title right. The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl. <laughs> and it's um, a continuation of the story of the first book and how she got her life back after this horrible 
divorce and another abandonment and how she woke up even more to how people were using her and uh, you know she's a force to be reckoned with my kid and I love it she calls me out on a lot of my stuff and I go yeah I taught you well because you're right <laughs> and the first book is called Eat, Pray, Eat, Pray, and Pray, Eat, Pray, Eat, Pray, Eat, <laughs> Make sure I got that right, too. Is there another one? No? No. Okay. John. I don't know if it's just nostalgia or, or what it is, but it seems like a lot of the stuff that was from the 80s, and maybe it's just because that's the era that I grew up in, but the 70s and the 80s, a lot of those, those movies from that time, it seems like it had a, a sort of a, a little bit more of a magic to us than a lot of the stuff that's coming out now. Do you guys think that that, that is just nostalgia or that maybe times have changed? Well, both. I think times have changed and y'all have to understand that our industry represents where the major culture is at the time. They produce and write what they think you want. So if you want a better world and better product, it starts with you. I, I think the directors, the directors back then had a lot more influence on how a, a movie turned out. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is with the CGI, and I'm not, I lo love the Avengers movies. I took my son, Hunter, to see every one on the first day. But it's like a lot of the movie is CGI that's being done by a CGI uh, effects group that's also doing the other movies. So that part of the movie is actually not directed by the director. It's directed by that team of CGI artists. So you're seeing the same cookie cutter type thing because it's being used in the same type of movies big action <laughs> battle scenes at the end. And the directors don't necessarily, I think, have the same amount of say over, you know, that the sequence. But, I mean, that's very true, Robert. Look at the state, and I'm not gonna get political, <laughs> but look at the state of our country. You, you know, we had inklings of stuff like this in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. But we could sit down and talk. We could communicate. And that says something about our souls, I think, which is being expressed today in television and film. I saw some more over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, uh, this is actually this is for both of y'all. Um, the scene after Henry Elliott uh, discovers TV's EMPR is off, and next evening, family dinner, he's explaining it, and uh, you're just kind of tweeting, antagonizing him and all, till finally Elliott explodes and was like, basically calls you penis breath. <laughs> yep. And your reaction was like, you admonished him, but you were laughing at him. You're like, oh, yeah. It's perfect. Um, was, that, was that, first of all, was that scripted? Second of all, was that an actual Well, we, we, have, differ we have differing rememberings <laughs> about this. I, I wasn't expecting it. That was a real, and Stephen used to do this all the time. He would whisper to the kids, okay, say this, or, <laughs> You know, he would keep us all off balance, which is the best way to work with kids, by the way. Because if they always continually just say the same thing over, it gets really rough. So that was a real, honest, motherly reaction. Now, you're, to, yeah, he's got a whole no, different way of remembering. He was given a different direction, right? <laughs> Well, I, I do remember in this, I don't remember penis breath being specifically in the script because <laughs> I think I would have had a hard time with it. But I do remember she had, Melissa had a real good, she had a lot of very vivid teenage, the douchebag talk, I remember that was in the script. The, yeah. A lot of the, the lines were real, uh, 
you know, stuff that teenagers would say. That specific line, I think it was a surprise because your reaction, but you did it the same, I mean, you did it. It was perfect reaction. And you Thank did it, you. and you did it, you know, again and again. So it wasn't just one take. I mean, it well, was- Well, if something works the first take. Then you did it, yeah. Yeah. We did a, that scene a lot. That scene was done in uh, coverage and then uh, from a million different angles. And that's why if you notice the scene, if you watch the scene closely, you can see Drew's hamburger. It's growing and then it's shrinking. <laughs> and then another take, it's growing again. And it's on her fork. She's eating it off her fork. And so, yeah, I, I think that, that that reaction, I love it every single time. And then the reaction after that, when, you, when he says, I can't, he's in Mexico with Sally. Well, what that, happened with uh, that is, see, I didn't expect that. Because in the script, I wasn't supposed to get up and leave. No. And was... what happened when he said that is Mary, I felt all these tears coming up, and I thought, I don't want my kids to see me cry, so I got up and left. And Stephen comes over and goes, why did you get up and, and leave the table? And, he, and I explained to him what happened, and he looked at me. He called the crew on, he said, I need you to build a kitchen wall over here with a sink with running water. And then we went back and picked me up leaving the table again to go over to that sink, put my dishes in it so we could bring me into that big close-up where I say he hates Mexico. It's a beautiful And scene. it all happened just like that because Mary couldn't stay at the table because she didn't want her kids to see her cry. Yes, lovely. Uh, I know where Venus Brad came from. Uh-oh. <laughs> Theater work I did, I was really proud of. Especially, um, I did a production of Master Harold and the Boys that I thought, you know, I was happy with. Um, but that's like a kind of an evolving thing, you know. Sometimes you start out, you're not so happy with it, and by the end of the run, you're happy with it. Yes. Well, Cujo's my favorite film. Oh. Uh, I'm just really proud of my work. Yeah. She's, she's great. of the week. I was like the queen of the movies of the week in the 80s that, um, that I was really proud of. Um, Texas Cadet Murders is one of them. I, I think I have three scenes in there, but one of them is a five-page <laughs> Here come the tears. <laughs> you wonder why I'm an actress. Um, there's a five-page scene in there where uh, they come in and tell me that my daughter has been found dead. My agent said, Dee, I don't think you want to do this. There's only three scenes. I read it. I called him and I said, how much do I have to pay them to do this? Oh. 
I read that scene once, and I thought, I, I can't read it again until I learn the lines going down there because I just knew it. I just knew every single moment of emotion that would happen to me if that, you know, when you, when you get material and you go, oh my God, don't let this ever happen to me in my life, but can I do the film? It's, it's kind of magical, really, because if you can let yourself go there and go there truthfully, it's such a gift to the audience. It, it heals people, it helps them laugh or cry or, or deal with things in their life that, that they don't have the strength to deal with by themselves and they can do it with us. one of the grandest days of my youth. You know, it was really the first major film with a major director for me. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. We went to Las Hadas, Mexico, and they put me up in a suite that was all marble. I called my mom and I said, our whole family could move in here, mom. <laughs> it was, and Blake, Blake Edwards just took care of me like, like a daughter. He was so wonderful to me. And Dudley Moore, oh, Dudley and I danced on many tabletops in Mexico, let me tell you. <laughs> he was just awesome. Thank you for mentioning that, thank you. Yeah, I wanna talk about another movie of yours. I know this is an ET panel. But do we have any horror Christmas fans? Christmas horror, anyone? What about Red Christmas? Has anyone seen Red Christmas? I didn't watch it. There you go. I want to know about that. Well, we had a ball. We that shot was Australian, it. right? We shot it in Australia. Um, somebody in my acting class knew the director, writer, and he got the script to me, and we hooked up uh, over Zoom, and I loved him so much, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come, and come down and do it. You know, he gave me a producer credit. I wasn't a producer, but he, he said, Dee, you brought in so many ideas and everything for the film that, that he kindly did that for me, but I love that film. Somebody back there said I didn't like it. Really? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Can't please everybody. What did you like about it? <laughs> it wasn't memorable. But usually I remember something about it, but I don't. I just remember watching it. That's it. That's, that's what stuck with me. It wasn't okay. memorable. I got one. I got one. My one of my favorite roles you've done is the frightened. Oh yeah. And it looked. I was so jealous because it looked like you had so much fun, oh. and it was like this. You got to be. You got, yeah. to, you got to get out everything, and it was it was great. It was a I was great like art for you, and it was like, yeah, she did, she you. nailed it. It was know? a great art to play, you know, starting out as this little victim and ending up as this crazy murderer. <laughs> that <laughs> was Peter Jackson. You with Peter yeah. Jackson, just a dear, dear man, uh, dear man, and um, Jake Busey and. Oh my God, Jeffrey Combs. Yes. Is he brilliant? He should have been nominated for that. I for loved sure. your transformation of that, and how in the beginning you looked older, and then when you were full blown crazy, you actually looked younger. That actually was my idea. Was it? Is yeah. It pretty brilliant. Because of uh, your whole we life, and. Yeah, well, because that's who she really was, mm -hmm. and that's what excited mm -hmm. her. And when we were. 
in the hair and makeup discussions. See, this is the way my method works. I don't think any of these things help. But we're, we're in that meeting and they're talking about getting older and I keep going, no, I'm getting younger. Mm -hmm. No, I'm getting mm -hmm. younger. No, I'm getting my mojo back. You know, that was all her telling me where to go, you know. So yeah, it was a ball and it was great to shoot in New Zealand. Unfortunately, my husband passed away during that movie too. Yeah. But uh, the movie was just awesome. It was a good final product, I gotta say. I know yeah. it must've been very difficult to shoot. I know that story, so it must've been really difficult, but it was a really good final product. Well, you know, guys, we all have our own stories, right? Yeah. We all have our own traumas. We all have stuff that's happened to us in childhood or adulthood, and it's what we do with it. It's what we make of it, whether we stay victims or we go, yeah, that happened, and now what do I do with me? And, and I, yeah, I, I really want you to hear that for everybody out there. It's whatever your, your hardships have been, Pick up and move on and be the best, most fabulous you you can be from now on. Because that is your past story. Mm -hmm. And the future is where you get to create everything else. We have time for one more question. <clears throat> The omen I love yeah. also. Anything that's like that. We uh, love the omen. Yeah. Gets me. The what one? The omen. Oh, yeah. The, love it. the original one. And has anybody seen Don't Look Now? Oh, yeah. Yes. Nicholas freaky! Brown. You never see anything, and it just is so freaky if you want to. What's the best kind? Huh? What's the best kind? Your yeah. imagination yeah. has to do all the work? Yeah. Since this is a horror crowd, and you're probably well versed in. There, there was a there was a, a movie I saw and I had a hard time finding it ever again. It was called The Other, not the Nicole Kidman movie. There was a movie about two little two little boys and one of them and I think Uta Hagen was in it and the little boy could I go in the, the eyes of the crow and yeah. fly and it freaked me out. Yeah. And that's I, I've had a hard time finding it ever since. I saw really? it on TV in the seventies. Um, that was it. a scary one. I need to find out. Yeah, two legs. <laughs> Netflix actually doesn't help with this. <laughs> Who does? A horror? A horror. Um, I'm not. Wait, I don't think Tweety Tan. You know, they have a horror queue. I will not tell you. A mile long. And my horror queue right now is about 300 movies a week. Well, yeah. check it out there then. Yeah. I will. I'll look. It's yeah. really obscure. I, I, it freaked me out. <laughs> well, I'm on a mission now. I'm on a mission. Steven did a horror TV movie that's very obscure also. Um, I don't know the name of it, but it's like kind of a haunted house movie uh, from the early okay? 70s. Steven Spielberg directed, a, it was a TV horror movie, so it was sort of before Jaws, after uh, Duel, I think, before Sugarland Express too. And um, that one's kind of hard to find. Yeah. You know, the, he was a big fan of the horror genre because Poltergeist, a lot of his ideas are in Poltergeist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was sort of, he would tell me about going to the theater in Phoenix when he was growing up. And he would sit in the balcony. It was like Creature of the Black Lagoon mm -hmm. or the early 50s horror movies. And he would dump like fake vomit. He'd pretend like he was throwing <laughs> up fake vomit on the people below. Oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was a big horror fan. Got, you know, with Poltergeist, he really accomplished a lot of his horror oh, yeah. instincts. And Indiana Jones, too. Yeah. I mean, I've been watching horror since I was eight years old, and nothing has really scared me except there is one scene in Poltergeist that traumatized me. And no, it's not the clown. It's when the guy's ripping chunks of his face oh. off and it's falling in yeah. the sea. Those are Stephen's hands. Really? Oh. 
Those are in that scene. Those are Stephen's hands. That is the he one side is still. That's the one yeah. scene that makes me nauseous. He is still. a walking encyclopedia. Well, he told me. He, he was all excited. He told me. He goes, like, I got to peel this guy's face off, and he was all excited about it. <laughs> you know, it's he, he was like a teenager. He is very much a kid in a lot of ways. <laughs> well. Guys, thank you so much. I think that's a great way to end it. Yeah, we can hang here okay. forever. Thank you. I could.